Well, if you didn't already know, Warren Buffett just held his annual meeting here today and he just released his shareholder letter. And what I wanna do for you guys, I wanna go through the highlights of this shareholder letter. There's a lot to go through. So I thought I would just pick out the most important parts that I kinda wanna point out to you that I think you guys would think are really relevant. So hit a thumbs up if you appreciate me doing this, guys. I hope you enjoy this. So first off here in the annual shareholder letter that Warren Buffett just came out with, he shows the compounded annual gain of basically Berkshire Hathaway, his company, versus like the S&P 500, and that's with dividends included. That's over on the right-hand column. We're gonna see S&P 500, you would have got about a 9.7% gain, which is, is good, that's, like, that's good, okay? But then you look at Warren Buffett, and you're talking about 18.7% gain. You're talking about basically a double up there. That just kind of shows how great of an investor Warren Buffett has been over time, guys. That's unbelievable, all right? Now let's get into some of this reading here, okay? The, the first thing that really caught my attention was what he called focus on the forest, forget the trees. He says, investors who evaluate Berkshire sometimes obsess on the details of many of our diverse businesses. As you know, like Warren Buffett owns a massive amount of companies, either 100% or partial ownership, okay? He says, our economic trees, so to speak. Analysis of that type can be mind-numbing given the vast array of specimens <laughs> ranging from twigs to redwoods. And once again, Warren Buffett, they own a you know, very small businesses and they own massive businesses. He says, a few of our trees are diseased and unlikely to be around a decade from now. Many others, though, are destined to grow in size and beauty. Fortunately, it's not necessary to evaluate each tree individually to make a rough estimate of Berkshire's intrinsic business value. That's because our forest contains five groves of major importance, each of which can be appraised with reasonable accuracy in its entirety. Four of those groves are differentiated clusters of businesses and financial assets that are easy to understand. The fifth, our huge and diverse insurance operation delivers great value to Berkshire in less obvious manner. One I will explain later in this letter. So basically he's saying to his potential shareholders out there, people that already own the stock, he's saying, don't get caught up in, in let's say we have one or two bad businesses that aren't doing so well right now. Focus on the fact that we have a massive gauntlet of businesses and the majority of them are doing very good and are expanding their businesses. That's kind of his point there, okay? He has a great quote from Abraham Lincoln here. He says, Abraham Lincoln once posed the question, quote, if you call a dog's tail a leg, how many legs does it have? And then answered on his own cue, four, because calling a tail a leg doesn't make it one. Abe would have felt lonely on Wall Street. Buffett was being funny there because he basically doesn't agree with the fact that they have to account for an amortization cost in one of their businesses, all right? Berkshire's runner-up grove by value in its collection of equities typically involving a five to 10% ownership position in a very large company. As noted earlier, our equity investments we're worth nearly 173 billion a year, and holy smokes, an amount far above their cost. If the portfolio had been sold at its year-end valuation, federal income tax of about 14.7 billion would have been payable on the gain. In all likelihood, we will hold most of these stocks for a long time. Eventually, however, gains generate taxes at whatever rate prevails at the time of sale. Our investees paid us $3.8 billion last year in dividends, a sum that will increase in 2019. Far more important than the dividends, though, are the huge earnings that are annually retained by these companies. Consider an indicator that these figures over our five largest holdings. And here, basically, he shows you the retained earnings last year of his five biggest positions, which was around $6.8 billion. But then you go ahead and look at just the dividends alone. Like, the, the five biggest holdings of theirs paid them out nearly $3 billion in dividends. That is just mind blowing guys. Oh, about $3 billion in just his five biggest positions paid them out in dividends last year. That is incredible. That is incredible. Okay. Uh, Buffett goes on here to say, all of the major holdings enjoy excellent economics and most use a portion of their retained earnings to repurchase their shares. We like that very much. If Charlie and I think an investee stock is underpriced, we rejoice when management employs some of the earnings to increase Berkshire's ownership percentage. Basically, he's talking about when a company does a share buyback, he believes that company's undervalued, the company believes it's undervalued, they go ahead and purchase some shares, right? That basically means Berkshire's ownership stake in that company because as a company buys back more shares, 
obviously that takes more shares off the market, which means Berkshire, basically his company has a bigger and bigger ownership stake. So he uh, definitely applauds share buybacks. He says, here's one example drawn from the table above. Berkshire's holdings in American Express have remained unchanged for the past eight years. Meanwhile, our ownership increased from 12.6% to 17.9% because of repurchases made by the company. Last year, Berkshire's portion of the 6.9 billion earned by American Express was 1.2 billion, about 96% of the 1.3 billion we paid for the entire stake in the company years ago. That is incredible, okay? When earnings increase and shares outstanding decreases, owners over time usually do well. He says, in the fourth quarter, Berkshire held around 112 billion at year end in US Treasury bills and other cash equivalents with another 20 billion in miscellaneous fixed income instruments. We consider a portion of that stash to be untouchable, having pledged to always have at least 20 billion in cash and cash equivalents, but basically meaning they got 100 plus billion just sitting around. Buffett's looking for a big deal out there. He doesn't know what he's gonna buy. As I posted in my video earlier today on Financial Education, the main channel, I think he should add uh, Tesla shares heavily right now. I think you should buy a five to $10 billion position there. Check out that video if you haven't, by the way. He says, Berkshire will forever remain a financial fortress. In managing, I will make expensive mistakes of commission and will also miss many opportunities, some of which should have been obvious to me. At times, our stock will tumble as investors flee from equities, but I will never risk getting caught short of cash. In the years ahead, we hope to move much of the excess liquidity into businesses that Berkshire will permanently own. The immediate prospects for that, however, are not good. Prices are sky high for businesses possessing decent long-term prospects. Basically saying he doesn't like the, the valuations of a lot of these private companies out here. The disappointing reality means that 2019 will likely see us again expanding our holding of marketable securities. We continue nevertheless to hope for an elephant-sized acquisition. Even at our ages, 88, Warren Buffett's 88 and Charlie Munger's 95. I'm the young one. That prospect is what makes, <laughs> what causes my heart and Charlie's to beat faster. Just writing about the possibility of a huge purchase has caused my pulse rate to soar, he says. Being funny there. He says, my expectation of more stock purchases is not a market call. Charlie and I have no idea how stocks will behave next week or next year. Predictions of the sort have never been part of our activities. Our thinking rather is focused on calculating whether a portion of an attractive business is worth more than its market price. In the simplest terms possible, Buffett's saying he's probably gonna be buying some stocks in 2019, more than likely, of course, the market could go up like crazy. Maybe he's not buying as much, but it sounds, uh, for the most part, that he's much more interested in buying stocks right now than private businesses as far as buying 100% ownership stakes because he says valuations are too high on most private businesses out there. So that's something to take into account, okay? As far as repurchases and reporting, he said earlier I mentioned that Berkshire will from time to time be repurchasing in its own stock, assuming we buy at a discount to Berkshire's intrinsic value, which certainly will be our intention, repurchases will benefit both those shareholders leaving the company and those who stay. True, the upside from repurchases is very slight for those who are leaving. That's because careful buying by us will minimize any impact to Berkshire stock price. Nevertheless, there is some benefit to sellers of having an extra buyer in the market. For continuing shareholders, the advantage is obvious. If the market prices a departing partner interest at, let's say, 90 cents on the dollar, continuing shareholders reap an increase in per share intrinsic value with every repurchase by the company. Obviously, repurchases should be price sensitive. Blindly buying an overpriced stock is value destructive, a fact lost on many promotional or even overly optimistic CEOs. So one of the very obvious things to see in the shareholder lever is Buffett is very bullish on share repurchases, not only for a lot of his companies he owns, but his own stock as well when he, when he sees it's undervalued, okay? Which I believe he kind of sees it undervalued right now. And of a lot of his other companies he already owns, I think he sees a lot of them as uh, undervalued stock. So he loves share repurchases. He, he used to not be as big of a fan, but it seems like in recent years, he's turned into a much bigger fan of share repurchases, okay? Okay. This is kind of where he takes some quarterly result shots. Okay, He says, for 54 years, our managerial decisions at Berkshire have been made from the viewpoint of shareholders who are staying, not those who are leaving, as in selling the stock and getting out of it, right? 
Consequently, Charlie and I have never focused on current quarter results. Berkshire, in fact, may be the only company in the Fortune 500 that does not prepare monthly earnings reports or balance sheets. I, of course, regularly view month monthly financial statements of most of our subsidiaries, but Charlie and I learn of Berkshire's overall earnings and financial position only on a quarterly basis. Furthermore, Berkshire has no company-wide budget, though many of our subsidiaries find one useful. Our lack of such an instrument means that the parent company has never had a quarterly number to hit shunning many of those bogeys sent by an important message for many of our managers reinforcing the culture we prize. Over the years, Charlie and I have seen all sorts of bad corporate behavior, both on the accounting and operationally induced by the desire of management to meet Wall Street expectations. What starts as an innocent fudge in order to not disappoint the street, say trade loading at quarter end, turning a blind eye to raising insurance losses, or drawing down a cookie jar or reserve can become the first step toward full-fledged fraud. Playing with the numbers just this once may be well the CEO's intent. It's seldom the end result. And if it's okay for the boss to cheat a little, it's easy for subordinates to rationalize similar behavior. At Berkshire, our audience is neither analysts nor commenters. Charlie and I are working for our shareholder partners. The numbers that flow up to us will be the ones we send on to you. That's basically just uh, Warren Buffett saying he doesn't agree with quarterly results. He thinks that produces a lot of people trying to move numbers around to make it look like, oh, we were a little better here or there. Oh, let's just do this just once to make Wall Street be happy. But then it starts going into you know a much, much, much bigger thing, okay? Now here Buffett shows a lot of the biggest positions that Warren Buffett owns in terms of stocks. He says, Charlie and I do not view the 170, nearly 3 billion detailed as an above reflection of ticker symbols, a financial dalliance to be determined because of downgrades by the street, expected Federal Reserve actions, possible political developments forecast by economists or whatever else, or whatever else might be the subject. What we see in those holdings rather is an assembly of companies that we partly own and that are also on a way basis are earning about 20% on the net tangible equity capital required to run their businesses. These companies also earn their profits without employing excessive levels of debt. And if we look here, they're profitable on almost all the positions as far as what they bought in the past versus what those, those positions are actually worth now. I mean, look at American Express alone. $1.2 billion was their cost when they bought that position. It's now worth uh, $14.4 billion. That's incredible, right? Uh, Apple, uh, the only one that you can find find that's down is JP Morgan Chase, but that's a pretty new position, so I, I wouldn't even really ding him for that. Almost everything they've bought over time is up other than JP Morgan Chase, and once again, they just bought that recently, and net net, they're up about $70 billion in terms of the stocks they own, which is absolutely incredible. And then just to cap some things off here, I think Buffett puts it great. He calls this part the American tailwind. He says, on March 11th, it will be 77 years since I first invested in an American business. The year was 19 1942, and I was 11 years old, and I went all in investing $111.75 I had begun accumulating at age six. What I bought was three shares of City Service Preferred. I had become a capitalist, and it felt good. Let's now travel back through the two 77 years that preceded my purchase. That leads us in the starting point of 1788, a year prior to George Washington's installation as our first president. Could anyone then have imagined what their new country would accomplish in only three 77 year lifetimes? During the two 77 year periods prior to 1942, the United States had grown from 4 million people, about a half of 1% of the world's population, into the most powerful country on earth. In that spring of 1942, though it faced a crisis, crisis, the U.S. and its allies were suffering heavy losses in a war that we had just entered only three months earlier. Bad news arrived daily. 
Despite the alarming headlines, almost all Americans believed on March 11th that the war would be won. Nor was their optimism limited to victory. Leaving aside the congestial pessimists, Americans believed that their children and generations beyond would live far better lives than themselves had led. The nation's citizens understood, of course, that the road ahead would not be a smooth ride. It had never been. Early in its history, our country was tested by a civil war that killed 4% of all American males and led President Lincoln to openly ponder whether a quote, a nation so conceived and so dedicated could long endure. In the 1930s, America suffered through the Great Depression, a punishing period of massive unemployment. Nevertheless, in 1942, when I made my purchase, the nation expected post-war growth, a belief that proved to be well-founded. In fact, the nation's achievements can be described as breathtaking. Let's put numbers to that claim. If my $111.75 $0.75 had been invested in a no-fee S&P 500 index fund and the dividends had been reinvested, my stake would have grown to be worth pre-taxes $606,811 on January 31st, 2019, the latest date available before printing this letter. That is a gain of 5,288 for one. Meanwhile, a $1 million investment by a tax-free institution of that time, say a pension or college endowment, would have grown to about 5.3 billion. Let me add one additional calculation that I believe will shock you. If that hypothetical institution had paid only 1% of its assets annually to various helpers, such as an investment managers and consultants, its gain would have been cut in half to 2.65 billion. That's basically taking a shot at fund managers there. That's what happens over 77 years when the 11.8% annual return actually achieved by the S&P 500 is recalculate it to 10.8%. He says, those who regularly preach doom because of the government's budget deficits, as I regularly did myself for years, might note that our country's national debt has increased roughly 400 fold during the last of my 77 year periods. That's 40,000%. Suppose you had foreseen this increase, panicked at the prospect of runaway deficits and a worthless currency. To protect yourself, you would have eschewed stocks and opted instead to buy three one-fourth ounce of gold with your $111.75. And what that supposed protection would have delivered, you would now have an asset worth $4,200, less than 1% of what would have been realized from a simple unmanaged investment in the American business. The magical metal was no match for American metal. Our country's almost unbelievable prosperity has been gained by, in a bipartisan manner. Since 1942, we have had seven Republican presidents and seven Democrats. In the years they served, the country contended at various times with a long period of viral inflation, a 21% prime rate, several controversial and costly wars, the resignation of a president, a pervasive collapse in home values, a paralyzing financial panic, and a host of other problems. All endangered scary headlines and they're all history now. Christopher Wren, an architect of St. Paul's Cathedral, lies buried within the London church. Near the tomb are posted these words of the description translated in from Latin. If you would seek my monument, look around you. Those skeptical of American's economic playbook should heed this message. In 1788, to go back to our starting point, there really wasn't much here except for a small band of ambitious people and an embryonic governing framework aimed at turning their dreams into reality. Today, the Federal Reserve estimates our household wealth at 108 trillion dollars, an amount almost impossible to comprehend. Remember earlier in this letter how I described retained earnings as having been the key to Berkshire's prosperity. So it has been with America. In the nation's accounting, the comparable item is labeled as savings and save we have. If our forefathers had instead consumed all they produced, 
there would have been no investment, no productivity gains, and no leap in living standards. Charlie and I happily acknowledge that much of Berkshire's success has simply been a product of what I think should be called the American tailwind. It is beyond arrogance for American businesses and individuals to boast that they have done it all. The tidy rows of simple white crosses at Normandy should shame all those to make claims. There are also many other countries around the world that have bright futures. Above that, we should rejoice. Americans will be both more prosperous and safer if all nations thrive. At Berkshire, we hope to invest significant sums across borders. Over the next 77 years, however, the major source of our gains will almost certainly be provided by the American tailwind. We are lucky, gloriously lucky, to have the force at our back. And that's just a great way of putting it, guys. Thank you for watching, and have a great day.